Hi, and welcome to our first lecture on Chapter 1 material from the OpenStax textbook. I'm using our free open source material for every lecture, and the original lecture slides were created by these following contributors. My lectures that you'll be watching have been changed a bit from these originals through my own edits, comments, and some examples sprinkled throughout each chapter. So what is biology? Ology refers to the study of, and bio refers to life. So biology is the study of life. And so far as we know, life's only found on Earth. It's really interesting because when we send things from Earth into outer space, like satellites, we actually have to make sure we're not bringing organisms or microbes out there from Earth that might contaminate the new place that we're exploring. And this is kind of similar to if you were to fly to Hawaii or to another country, where while you're on the airplane, you usually have to fill out some kind of agricultural form to make sure that we're not bringing plants or animals into a new area that could potentially cause problems. Some microbes in particular, like the ones shown here, can survive extremely harsh environments, including like the one that's written in this NASA website article here, a Mars-like habitat. And we're going to learn more about these microbes in a later chapter. So biology is the study of organisms, but also how they interact with each other and their environments. Biology is a type of science, and science refers to knowledge. It comes from the Latin word for knowledge. So what we're looking at are general truths or general laws, and you might be familiar with the laws of thermodynamics from your chemistry or your physics class that you've taken already. Um, for example, the first law of thermodynamics is energy cannot be created or destroyed. In biology, we're trying to figure out the laws that govern living organisms. For example, why do we get sick? Um, let's say the flu season's coming up. What causes the flu? Is it stress? Is it heartbreak? Or is it viruses? You know, for hundreds of years, we didn't know what caused diseases like the flu. It really wasn't until a bunch of curious people followed a rigorous set of steps called the scientific method that really allowed us to design experiments to derive the knowledge to answer questions like this, like what causes the flu. So biology is part of the field of natural sciences, things that are naturally found in the physical world. And the natural sciences include things that are not alive as well, like the study of gems and minerals or the study of stars and planets. It's important to note that science and biology are restricted to natural explanations of phenomena. We use evidence or findings that we and others can see, can hear, observe, and use to explain or answer questions that we might have. Things that are supernatural, where we can't use the scientific method to find answers, these are not considered part of science. So when we're seeking knowledge through the scientific method, we generally use one or both types of scientific reasoning to do so, inductive reasoning and or deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning occurs when we use several specific and related observations to make some general conclusion. And our book gives us a nice example of brain studies where scientists looked at a bunch of people's brains and which parts were activated when they saw pictures of food. They found that all of these people in the study had the same part of their brain light up, a part in an area called the ventral visual cortex kind of near this area. So the specific observations they started with were of the individual brains of each person in the study. And the general conclusion they came up with were that P 
people, when we see pictures of food, we're going to have greater brain activity in this, in this region. And we often see inductive reasoning in descriptive or discovery sciences, where we're making observations to discover something new. Deductive reasoning, on the other hand, begins with a general principle or idea, and this is used to predict specific results. They, we often call this a top-down approach. For example, we could start with the general statement that prokaryotes are organisms without a nucleus. And we're going to learn more about these terms later on in the course. Uh, bacteria like E. coli, like the ones shown here, also do not contain a nucleus. And then I can conclude more specifically that because they don't contain a nucleus, bacteria, these bacteria, are prokaryotes. We usually use deductive reasoning in hypothesis-based science, where we use generally known laws or theories to generate an initial hypothesis, which is a tentative answer to a question. And then we conduct some kind of experiment in order to get those specific results. Our textbook has a nice overview of the two types of reasoning. And recall that inductive reasoning goes from specific to general. And if these general conclusions become well accepted by the scientific community, they might be used as the theory or law that becomes the general premise of a study that uses deductive reasoning. So in all of our science experiments and labs, we'll be using the scientific method or some close variation of the scientific method to complete our scientific study. It's important to note the major steps of the scientific method. For example, you should be able to list all of these basic steps and in their correct order. And it's a really common test question, not only in our class, but on a lot of standardized exams. So let's go over the, this figure over here on the right and what the steps are. So usually the first step is that we're going to be making some kind of observation. So first step, observation. Two, you're going to ask a question about your observation. And I'm going to give you an example in a later slide. Three, we form a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a tentative answer to your question. It's a possible answer to your question. Four, you're going to make a prediction based on your hypothesis. And we usually state the prediction in some kind of if-then format. And again, we're going to see an example in a later slide. Step five, we're going to design an experiment to test our prediction. And then we get results and we analyze our results. So there are several possible outcomes. The first one could be that the results support our hypothesis. And we usually report this in, for example, a lab report, maybe a publication. Another possible scenario is that our results do not support our hypothesis, in which case we still report our results. We're not going to you know, fake them or change them. We have to report that our results did not support our hypothesis. And then we usually have to try again. We have to create some kind of new hypothesis and go through the steps again. So let's use the example from our textbook. In the example from our book, they're talking about a toaster. And we make an observation. My toaster is not working. So I put some bread in, I plugged it in, nothing happened. And then I ask a question. Why doesn't my toaster work? And then I'm going to create a hypothesis, a possible answer to my question. And that's maybe something is wrong with the power outlet. I'm going to create an if then statement, my prediction. So if something is wrong with the power outlet, then my coffee maker also will not work when I plug it into that power outlet. So I'm going to design an experiment 
where I plug my coffee maker into this outlet and I'm going to do that to the top and to the bottom just in case. And then I find out that actually my coffee maker works both when I plug it into the top outlet and when I plug it into the bottom. So do my results support or do not support my hypothesis? What was my hypothesis again? It was something's wrong with the outlet. So it seems like it's not supporting that hypothesis. So I report my results if it's a lab experiment, but then I really got to figure out another possible answer to my question. So maybe the toaster is broken, for example. So we do all of these scientific experiments and get results. Why? Why do we do this? The why can really be separated into two categories. And I think of the first category as just because and the second category as to solve a problem. So that just because category is known as basic science or pure science, and it's really to create knowledge. We want to create knowledge even if we might not be able to apply it right away. And that second scenario to solve a problem is really part of applied science. We're trying to use the scientific method to solve some kind of immediate problem. And just as your book states, there are benefits to both. We often need basic science before we can go into applied science. So our book goes through an example um, of Hurricane Irma and how it displaced thousands of baby squirrels, like this cute one shown here in this picture. And your book says, applied science was used to solve this immediate problem, how to rehabilitate uh, these squirrels. But then again, if the basic sciences didn't exist in the first place, scientists might not have been able to do this to rehabilitate these squirrels. Like they needed to know what are the most optimal conditions for these baby squirrels to thrive? What's the temperature that they should be placed in? Um, should they be placed together or separately? How much water do they need? What kind of food is best for these baby squirrels? And, you know, all of these, all of this information from basic science is needed for the applied science portion. So I think this is a really nice example of how the two, basic science and applied science, go hand in hand. So one of the major goals of scientists, both academic and those in industry, is to get published in some kind of scientific journal. So if you get good results, usually meaning that results, uh, your results support your hypothesis, you might want to go ahead and publish your results in some kind of scientific journal. Um, you know, so everyone sees what you've been doing and maybe you get famous. Uh, maybe not famous like Taylor Swift famous where everybody knows you, but at least the scientific community and those that are in similar fields of research. The most trustworthy journals out there are peer reviewed. What this means is that others, other experts in a similar field as yours, uh, read and critically evaluate your work and determine if it's worthy of publication. So this makes it a really rigorous process to be published. And even if they do accept your research paper, usually there are edits and details to explain. They might ask you, for example, why you chose a specific research method over another. And these papers usually follow a typical format with these different sections. In the middle of the semester, we're going to be reading a few papers. So you'll see these uh, sections again, and we'll talk about it in more detail then. So let's say you go through that peer review process and you get published. Once your results are published, the scientific community and maybe even the general public might have access to your research. What they're going to probably do is also critique your research and they might repeat your experiment or a similar experiment to see if they get similar findings. 
if other members of the scientific community also get similar results and your results become trustworthy, they usually start accepting your findings as true. But it's important to note that in science, we can never prove something is true. We can just show that it's not false. So in science, we usually accept something as true and know that it could be proven otherwise. So we accept things as true until there's evidence that shows us otherwise. Something that we always need to consider before designing any experiment is bioethics. What are the ethical, social, and legal implications that we need to consider? I would say that most of the time, especially now in modern times, most scientists do a great job with these considerations. And this is because we have learned from mistakes in our past or the mistakes of others. And your textbook has several great examples, some of which we're going to talk about again towards the end of the semester. One example your book talks about is Henrietta Lacks. She was a 30-year-old African-American woman who was diagnosed with cervical cancer, actually where I went to graduate school, so at the hospital at Johns Hopkins University. Her cancer cells happened to, to, to divide really well in the lab environment. Um, they couldn't find any other cells that divided as well. So really, without her knowledge or permission, some researchers took her cells and created um, what's now known as the HeLa cell line. HeLa is, comes from her initials, Henrietta Lacks. These cells have contributed, contributed to so many medical discoveries. Um, and I even remember working with her cells in grad school. And I asked my boss, I remember this, I remember asking my boss at the time, where are HeLa cells? I'm, where, where are they from? Where did they come from? And she didn't know. So I think this story and the history of Henrietta Lacks and her cells really only became well known after the publication of this book in 2010. If you ever have time to read it, it's in most public libraries. I also have a copy in my office on campus if you'd like to borrow it sometime. All right, so that takes us to the end of the first part of chapter one. I will see you guys again in part two of the chapter one lecture. Thanks.